Hi, so this is the simulation overview. So I want to take some time to go over uh, the basics of the simulation, getting started and understanding the principles behind it to make it easier for you to get started and up and running on this important assignment. Now, uh, as a student, you would click student registration and you would type in your first and last name and then your email address create a username, password, um, confirm the password, type in the security code above, and then click uh, agree to the term to continue registration. Uh, once, uh, I better, I'll go through and so you can see what the next screen is. Do, do, do. Okay, RRT7Z. Yes. Very important to click yes here, otherwise it won't work, and you'll think the security code is not working. Okay, so uh, activation code or use credit card. Uh, the activation code is something you get with a textbook. I don't believe I the textbooks we're using are going to have the activation code within it. So we're going you're going to have to use the credit card. And it's a standard form to fill out um, to put in your information for the credit card. And once the credit card um, is authorized, oops, okay, then you come to the main screen here and you type in your username and password. I suggest you keep your username and password the same as your net ID. That would make it easier so you won't forget, but you're, I guess, of course, you know, you're free to make it anything you want. We're going to type in our, our, our class code, which is found on the blackboard here, June 512. Uh, here we go. June 512 is our class code. Type that in. And then we're going to come to um, the screen here. Give me a second to resize it. Okay, so then we have two mo. We have the student user guide, which you of course want to click and pull down this PDF and save this PDF. And this goes through all the basics of the simulation, how the the mechanics, uh, ideas, strategies, the overall principles, formulas for the financial ratios. So the user guide is very useful, and I would suggest that you read it over. I've read it several times myself. And then we have two environments here. We have the individual practice and the classroom competition. Now the individual practice is exactly the same as the classroom competition, except you play by yourself against computer players. In the classroom competition, which is something that we will be doing, you're going to play against other real life students within the class. So to get started with the classroom competition, you click classroom competition, create a new company, uh, you're not going to join anyone's company, so you're going to create your own new company. So I'm going to create my company. And then I'm going to put in um, president is me. The VP is me for marketing, for sales, for production. I believe you have to fill these in. Oh, no, he doesn't. You don't have to. OK, so now I created my company. And I'm ready to uh, start round one. And I need to put input my sales department decisions, and my marketing decisions, my production decisions, and my finance decisions. But we're going to take a step back for a minute. I'm going to log back in. OK, so that's the classroom competition. So you should go in there and create a team for yourself. Um, and you're going to be working as a team of one competing against all the other students in class when in the classroom competition. I also, to get started, want you to work in the individual practice, which is a duplicate of the team competition, except you work by yourself against the computer. All right, so let me just resize the screen a bit. Okay, now 
In this environment, I'm going to actually run run through and talk about how this this is done. And it's the same individual or team competition. It's the same exact simulation. But here, I would want you to run two rounds uh, by yourself. So I get an idea of uh, make sure that you understand the simulation and that you know the basics before you get started with the team competition. Okay, so let's take it from top. In... Uh, the simulation, you're going to be run, running an automobile company and you're going to be in the sales department page that we're in now, we're going to be designing the auto. So each auto has a customer expectations range, which means the customers generally expect this class of car, the economy class, to have uh, a fuel economy, miles per gallon, of between 26 to 30 miles per gallon, horsepower between 75 to 100, 30 to 40 safety features, 10 to 20 luxury features, and 20 to 30 months of warranty or what they call reliability. And each of these have an importance factor. So when, a, when someone buys a car, the two biggest things they're looking at for an economy class car are the miles per gallon and the price. And this means that as far as competing with other team members, the better you do in these categories, the better you'll compete. They have a stronger influence. So you may want to go up to the top range of the customer expectations. And remember, you can go above or below the expectations, but you can't go below where, you know, simply the car's not going to work with one, you know, mile per gallon. So there are limits of how far above or below you can go. Um, so here we have the engine power isn't as important, so I'm going to go below the criteria. And for the safety features, I'll go in the middle somewhere of these criteria. And then it, as, as I change these criteria, you'll see that the labor and material numbers also recalculate here. And the total cost of my vehicle is $1,190. That's uh, material and labor to make a vehicle of this design. So I'm going to price it at... 1899 and I get a 37% profit margin and my sales are last year's sales were 17,000 I'm sorry 1750 so what is next year's sales going to be again you should refer to the student user guide and in here they have a chart they tell me that the economy class is going to grow 25% a year uh, they have a chart that in year zero the if if all customers expectations are met and you earn your equal share of market potential, your firm can expect to sell the following number of vehicles per year. So this means if everybody makes creates all the same cars, the same price, this is how much you would sell. Now that is a really good clue as to how much to, to um, cars to forecast. So in year one, 2188 would be the, I guess you could say, the average amount of cars sold. I think my car is a little bit better than average, so I'm going to put you know, 2,200 cars to sell. And now I just repeat the, pla the same thing for the sedan class. And I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to create my car design based on what I feel is a good uh, design type. And here I'm just, you know, I wouldn't say to copy me. I am just throwing this together really quick. So let's see, last year's sales were 2,000. It says the growth rate for the sedan is uh, 30%. So I'm just going to go make it 30% higher than last year. I don't think my car is going to be as better than most, so I'm just going to keep it on the average. The truck, I see with the truck, what's very important is uh, engine power. So I'll put you know some uh, extra engine power in there and some safety features, uh, luxury features, some months of reliability. I'll create a price. And I'll go back to see. It says 1800. I think maybe I could sell 2000. All right. And then the luxury class. And I'm going to create the luxury class vehicle. And set a price for it. Now, the 5%, the importance factor for price is less important to them. What's more important is that they get a luxury class car. And it actually, in some studies have shown that <clears throat> the higher price the car of the car, the more in demand it becomes. Because a luxury car is a statement that, hey, I'm rich and I'm buying an expensive vehicle. So they don't want to buy a vehicle that's 
you know, seems inexpensive. That's why when Honda and Toyota both created their luxury lines, they didn't create it under Honda or Toyota name. They created, you know, uh, Acura and Lexus because they wanted a name that standed for quality and they set their prices ex much, much higher than their um, main car lines. You know, because people want to drive, it's a status symbol. So there's this, this information, I'm told, comes from industry factors and standards. It's not something that they necessarily made up, but what um, consumers are looking for. So I'll just stay with, with the average. I think my car is average here. Okay, so here on the sales department page, I have um, developed uh, the basis of what my f four model types are going to be. My economy, sedan, luxury, and truck models. I gave an outline of how I want them to be built and the prices I want them to sell for. And, you know, I have an idea here of my profit margin, 60, 40, 44, and 37%. Now, I know from looking at the financial ratios from last year that my average uh, gross profit was 40%. So I always want my gross profits to be the same or higher in order to please my shareholders, owners, um, and investors. Okay. Now, after I create the car, I want everyone to answer these reflective observations. It's a way of making the simulation less of I'm just putting numbers in boxes and get you tied into a little bit more closely what exactly it is you're, des you're designing here and what you're doing. So the first question is describe your, your new strategy for redesigning your economy class vehicle. How will it help your company's performance? What factors influence your calculation of sales forecast in co uh, for the economy class vehicle? Okay, so here um, I'm going to write, I would write something that, you know, I redesigned the car based on what I thought my customers wanted most or would make the car the most attractive. And, you know, my strategy is to sell as many units as possible. And I say, as far as my company's performance, this, you know, um, this will add profits. And then I would actually go in and see, well, how many profits will it add? And I can go back up here and say, okay, well, um, if my cost is 1190 and I'm selling it for, say, 18 900 it's about seven thousand uh seven thousand dollars of profits per unit i'm selling two thousand two hundred units so i would actually give can give a number of how much profits it's going to generate for the company um and then uh, you know this the sales forecast i would say uh i looked at what the basis would be for the next year and felt the car was a little bit stronger so i increased it you know, this is basically a, what I want you to think about and write for each of the vehicle cl classes. And every round you'll be doing this. And I want to know what is your rationale for um, how you designed your cars. Because if something goes wrong and you don't get a lot of points or have a very bad round, I can actually go in here and get an idea and, think, and see what you're thinking and, and help you to do better. And it's also good for you to make this more of a role-playing experience and not just numbers and boxes type of game to get you a little tied into what's happening. So now the good news is this does take extra effort to fill out, and I understand that. For the practice rounds, I'm not expecting you to fill this out. For the team competition, I am expecting you to fill these out. So again, for the first two rounds of practice, you don't have to fill out these reflective observation questions. But for the team competition, I will want you to fill these out. And and they have to be filled out every round. You know. Um, Okay, so let's submit the sales data, and I move over to marketing. Okay, so let's just go, the reflective observations here is, what is your advertising slogan for each car? Um, so a slogan is, you know, a quick, um, so con for the economy class, you know, uh, cars that you to... trying to think of something good here. I don't know. Cars that move you um, I don't know. It's, it's kind of hard. I can think of a um, I don't know. Here's a really bad one. Cars that are Cheap but run well. Terrible, terrible slogan. 
Uh, and let's do the sedan. We could do better with this. The family car um, that drives like a luxury. Something like that. I don't know. But you get the idea. You make a slogan up. Hopefully you're more creative than I am right now. Um, what is your overall demographic and advertising strategy for each vehicle class? So for here, uh, I would want you to write uh, the economy class. I would say my demographic is young, just graduated. from college and uh, young just graduated from college um, we'll say 22 to 30 it's my demographic the strategy is um, focus focusing on the youth um, to establish uh, first car experience something like that you know where you give me a rationale for um, who you're selling the car to and why you're choosing them. So if it was economy class I'd say you know a focus it's a gateway car focusing um, freshly graduated students t to come into my brand and, and you know start with our economy class car and hopefully you know do such a great job that they stay with us through their different stages as they buy a truck or and they buy a luxury vehicle um, and then uh, so we go up here and then the my economy class should match what I'm saying down here so if I'm saying 22 to 30 years old and I could say an income you know of 45 to 60,000, something like that. So the dem whatever I put here, my demographic target should match my overall demographic and advertising strategy down here per class. Um, and for, for each car class, I have these advertising expectations, which means that this is what the industry is going to spend per class. So for the economy class vehicle, the industry is going to spend five, 500,000 to a million. And the importance factor is selling the vehicle is about 15%. Now, in the, in the student user guide, of course, they're going to list, uh, again, the percentage of effectiveness is for each of the vehicles. So newspapers and looks like television and newspapers are the most effective, where other media is less effective. So I'm going to go in here, and if I have you know, $500 to $1 million to work with, I'm going to put a majority of my budget into the two most effective areas. Now I don't want to neglect the other areas because that would just be giving um, these customers to whoever you know if nobody in, in our class invests in radio and one student puts one dollar in radio they'll get all the potential demand in that area because they're the only one advertising in that segment so you kinda want to spread your money around and um, this guide gives you a good idea of how the effectiveness of each of the but you don't enter percentages in here. You enter dollar amounts, so you have to break it up. Some students go with the exact percentages they have in the guide. I think you get a little bit more benefit by strategizing and trying to put your money um, where you where you think you can pick up the most vote uh, buyers. Okay, and then you explain down here what strategies you use when allocating your investment dollars for each vehicle. And I would say I would write something down here. Um, I put most of my money in newspapers and television because they're the most uh, have the highest um, effectiveness of 25% and 40% in this car class and I also put some money in some other media areas you know now from round now th again this is only for the team competition you don't have to do this for the individual practice but um, just going over it now so you get an idea that uh, of how to do it and then you just kind of repeat the same process for all four cars. You just now start with the sedan. You figure out what your demographic target is, how you're going to spend your advertising 
based on this criteria. Now you could go above or below, you know, if it says uh, a million, you can go, you know, above or below, I guess to a certain extent, um, for each of the car classes. It'll give you a warning if you spend too much or too little, uh, but just trying to give you an idea again so you don't try to pull numbers out of nowhere. It's giving you an idea of where the industry is and how they're spending their money. Okay, so pretty standard. And if you think back, you know, if you, you're to your marketing class, these are things you talked about in marketing, demographics, advertising investments in different areas, effectiveness, um, marketing, adver advertising slogans and marketing strategies. So this is all uh, stuff that you can incorporate in here into your strategy. So I'm just going to submit that. Then we come to... Um, The production department and in here I have currently one plant operating that can make a thousand cars now I'm forecasting 2200 cars here and I have a hundred cars in inventory so I'm gonna have to come up with um, two additional plants to make my total capacity 3,000 cars so every one plant if I buy one plant it's gonna Double, it's going to increase my capacity by a thousand cars and cost me ten million dollars. So, here by buying uh, two plants, I'm going to have a three thousand dollar, three thousand unit capacity. But I don't need to make three thousand cars in my production, I just need to make twenty one hundred. Now, I feel it's important that your excess shortage should always be zero. Why would you forecast twenty two hundred cars and say I'm going to make twenty five hundred cars because I'd like to have three hundred unsold vehicles of last year's model? It makes no sense. So you don't want to have an excess or shortage here. You know, you wouldn't want to forecast 2,200 cars and then build 1,800. And one, one big reason for this is that your pro forma financial statements will not be correct if you don't produce exactly what you say you're going you, you're gonna to be selling. Uh, okay. So now I need to do that for the economy class. I'm sorry, for the sedan and the truck. And what's nice, you see this number down here um, shows me how short I am. So I can just, uh, all I need to do, I'll buy additional plant here, and I just kind of make 1588, just copy, make the positive up here to get to zero. So here, I bought my extra capacity. Now, you don't want to say, you only need, you know, 1,500 cars here, so I only need to buy one plant. It would be a waste of assets to buy a second plant to say, oh, well, I just, bought two plants because I'll probably need it in the future. That would be like Ford setting up a whole production facility, hiring all these people, buying all the robotics, all the equipment, and saying to them, okay, everybody, just sit here for a year and do nothing, and then hopefully next year I'll get to you and make you build some cars. Now, you, you, you buy the plants, only the ones you need and are going to use. That makes your assets, your asset allocation the most efficient. So now we come to operational investments. And in here, we have four different types, new technologies, production robotics, equipment enhancement, efficiency software. And each investment, if I make a level one investment, it's going to, each level cost me $2 million. And for new technologies here, it's going to save me, reduces the material cost by car by 300 So I'm not going to see it this round, but next round, when everything is purchased and set up, my cars, I'll get a cost reduction for each of the cars. So, you know, I'm just going to just randomly select some numbers here for each of these cars. And, you know, you can buy, now you're limited. You can't buy, max it out to 10 on every level of the first round. You just don't have enough money to do that. So I may even, this may even be too much. I'll scale that back a little because we're spending a lot of money here. It's only my first year operating this company. I probably will come up short if I invest too heavily right now. So it's sort of something I'll have to balance later. And then the reflective observations, what, what is my capacity utilization percentage for each vehicle class? Um, and this is my t production units divided by my total unit capacity. So for example, here I have my unit capacity is 3,000, I'm producing 2,100, you know, divided by 3,000. And that's going to give me some percentage, and that's my utiliza capacity utilization. And this is important because you want to use as much of your factory as possible. Like I said, you know, you don't want to have a factory that can make 
3,000 cars or three factories making 3,000 cars and you only need 1,500 because you're only at 50% capacity. The rest is just wasted space and you're paying rent and utilities and, and payroll and all this, all this taxes on space that's not producing any benefit for your company. So that's the, I guess that's what they want to reinforce there. Your, what is your new strategy for operational investments per vehicle class and how will the current operational investments affect your company's performance? So for each vehicle class, I would say I'm investing one level in economy class. It's going to save me $300. The next round, I'll probably make at least, you know, two, 3,000 vehicles. Multiply that by 300. I get an idea of my cost savings. You know, and so this is just getting to think about why you're doing this and how this is going to help your company. And it's a really good thing to think of this. And, and so you're more than just, like I said, putting numbers in boxes here. You're thinking about the effects that your decisions are making. And this will help you, these reflective observations are find help students to make better decisions as they move forward through the simulation. All right, so I'm gonna submit this. And our last page is the finance area. So I get a set, the pro forma financial statements are financial statements based on the sales that I project in the sales department. So as long as I, I have a sale, I, my forecast, matches my production, my pro forma will be uh, correct. Now, this number of 55 million net profits here, this amount of money will only come true if I sell everything I have forecasted to sell. If I have any leftover inventory or I don't meet my sales goals, this pro forma financial statements will be different. So it's not, it's not a guarantee you're going to make this much money. It's only if you, you actually sell everything you forecasted, which doesn't always happen. So I have students usually come back to me quite often and say, you know, I was supposed to have net profits of $55 million, but when I processed it, it was only you know, $34 million. So I think the simulation is broken. No, the simulation is not broken. If you look under production, you'll see that you had a lot of leftover inventory. You didn't good, do a good job selling the cars you manufactured. And that's why you don't have the net income that was projected. Okay, so we can see here, this is the actual for last year. Uh, now I have, we always try to keep a minimum cash of 25 million and any excess cash gets put in this uh, cash surplus deficit. So this deficit was actually, gets added to the next year here because we're always keeping our cash balance at 25 million and I have now a deficit of 20 million. Why do I have a deficit of 20 million? Well, I'm trying to, you know, increase my assets to 164 million dollars worth of assets. However, I only have li liability and equity worth 143 million. So that means I need to come up with another 20 million dollars of of equity or liabilities to cover the assets I'm purchasing. So if I'm purchasing 20 million dollars of assets I haven't covered through my equity or liabilities, it means I need more capital. So I'm going to go up here and under additional funds, I'm going to try and raise uh, uh, additional monies. So my goal for this round is uh, I'm going to try and raise 30 million. Okay, so I'm going to 10 million here. Ten million in so ten million in uh, long-term debt, and you see how the interest rate changes. I'll just put this um, to zero. My interest rate is two percent, um, but if I borrow, ten million dollars, it goes up to six percent. So, as you borrow more and more money, your interest rate goes higher because your company's riskier. I'm also going to issue $10 million worth of stock. Okay, so $30 million is being issued, and now I have um, a surplus of $8 million. Now, the surplus is in $10 million because I'm paying extra interest. That's why, if you saw, I had a $20 million deficit. I borrowed $30 million. Now, why don't I have a $10 million surplus? Because the in increased cost of my interest. So now I'm going to keep, I want to keep extra money, a small surplus, because if I don't sell every car that I promised to sell, I could have a deficit. And that comes with a consequence. So let me um, process the game. Now, in the, in the individual practice, whenever I process 
the game, I submit the financial data and complete the round, it's going to automatically calculate and give me some results. You will not see this in the team competition. You'll have to wait for me to calculate. To, to, I'm going to wait for everybody to be done, and then I'll process it on my side as, as a faculty member. Uh, because I have to wait for everybody's decisions so you can all be processed together because your direct decisions in the team competition affect each other. Uh, here you're just going in the individual, you're going against the computer players, which is nice because you can kind of cycle through and go as fast as you need to and get instant results. And what's good about the individual practice, even though I'm only asking you to do two rounds, you can actually do a full six rounds here and then restart the simulation again. Uh, and do it as many times as you want. And this could be a good area to practice in uh, to get better and better at the simulation so you can get the max amount of points that you need to get the full 20 points for the assignment. Now, on my side as a faculty member, when you when it records everything you do, so even if you reset the simulation, I'll see that you already played it before and you'll, you'll still always get credit for those two rounds. Now, let's analyze what happens. Here in the overview, I mean, now I'm in year two, but this is the overview of looking at my year one results compared to my year two results. And this, the way the points work is I had my revenue per share um, in year zero was 12. We also have the same year zero statistics. Year one, these are my actual year one results based on the work I just completed. And I got my per revenue per share up to $19.95. And that's a 64% year YOY is year over year improvement. I earned 64 points for that. Uh, however, if we look at the uh, see, my look at my gross profits, I went from 40 percent. That's where we all started 40 percent, and I got it up to 48 percent. So that was a you know a 19 percent improvement. I earned 19 points for that, and I had a 32 percent increase in my Operational profit margin, I got 30 points for that, and I had I went from 16 to 21 percent of my net, and I went to 31 percent for that. Although my total asset turnover was uh, 1.6 to 1.39, a 14 percent decline, I lost 14 points. Well, why is that? Well, I bought a lot of assets and I bought a lot of factories. I wasn't really using the full capacity of those factories, so all these additional assets I bought, I wasn't able to generate as much profits for them as I, I would have hoped. So my asset turnover is actually a little bit slower than previous rounds. And you're not going to be perfect or make points in every financial ratio here, but it's going to go through the majority of them. And I earned a decent amount of points here. My Here on the market capitalization, my mar the total capitalization of my company, which is measured by stock price times outstanding shares, actually increased uh, 260%. The maximum points I can get in any category is 100%. Is 100. So even though my earnings per share went up 116%, I can only get 100 points as my maximum. Okay, so now on my, my sales versus forecast, um, I came very close from some categories here. The worst one being, I guess, truck. Uh, previously, I had sold 65% of what I promised, and now I sold 81% of what I promised. So I had um, improved that by 20%, so I picked up some points in my forecasting. Uh, but I accidentally had a deficit. You saw that my pro forma said surplus. Why did I have this deficit? And I lost 100 points. Because here, I can tell since my my forecast isn't 100%, I sold less. I didn't sell as many cars as I'd promised, so I had a surplus in inventory. Anyway, even with all those problems, I still made 584 points. My goal is 500 points around, so I'm doing pretty good. Now, in starting in the the second round, I can look at a bunch of charts. So I have these individual charts that show me my sales per year, and I went from 121 million to 239 million. My profits went from 18 million to 49 million, so I'm doing very well. Uh, and this is just profits to sales chart overlay. My stock price went up from, let's see, about $5 a share to 14. My earnings per share from $1.90 to 4 uh, And then this is, I think, a very important chart. So here, the sedans, I forecasted 2,600 sedans. I could have sold 2,700. 
and 44. So this pink area is what I actually sold. This blue area is what I could have sold. So I should have built more sedans. Now, for the truck luxury and economy class, I actually sold, uh, I met my full market potential, but I think I overproduced those, which we could see in a minute. They, we also have the advertising charts to show me versus the computer players, how what how much I spent for advertising versus, uh, versus what um, the computer players have spent. So you can give me a good idea of where I am in that. And then the industry charts is going to look at me compared to the industry. So I'm the blue bar. Computer player one is the orange bar and computer player two is the green bar. And you can see that computer player two made the most points, but I was able to compete, beat computer player two in the, in the overview points. And it just shows me the, the stock price per team, the sales. And if you wand over each of the, the bars, you, they tell you who, what company, and how much they made. And then they get my pie chart on my sales and units and dollars. So the charts are a nice way to just get a quick overview of what you did. And the industry page, it backs up for you uh, how you design your vehicle, how all the, the key features, your price, uh, your profit margin per vehicle, and your market potential. It gives you know, a couple key statistics here and your ratios and your points. Now what's important, important about this is not so much the recording of your data, you get to see what the other teams did and what, how they made their cars and what they decided. So if another team like Computer Player 2 did better, we can get a better idea of what they did differently from us to help them score so high. And it, in the financials or your financials are backed up for you. For and That's going to be important when we do our presentation project. And then back to sales department. So again, now we're going to go back in and we're going to have to redesign the vehicles again. So I'm going to go in and um, uh, remake my vehicles. And I'm just going to do this fast. I'm not really paying too much attention. just want to kind of... some figures in, some sales prices. Okay. And I mean you'll you will put uh, significantly more effort into this than I'm doing right now. I'm just kind of just completing this quickly to move forward with this. So you got to go in and redesign every round you go in and you keep redesigning your vehicles. And then and since your, your vehicles become redesigned, again you have to answer the reflective observations of how you redesign your vehicles, what's your strategy and how is this different than last round and how it's going to affect your forecast. And because I know I'm going to have questions about this, I have to keep saying it for the individual practice you don't have to fill out the reflective observations that's something that I want each student to do only for the team competition okay and then let's see I have my advertising ranges and what's nice I guess about the advertising your slogans and your demographics um, remain the same you don't have to keep typing those in unless you want to update them the only box you have to keep refilling in here is uh, your asset allocation and your um, advertising investment. Uh, so these these boxes are sticky. This one isn't. Um, so again, here, I mean, this takes some time. You get a look at the user guide and the percentages. They don't change the effectiveness per round, but the money does change. As the industry comes bigger, each round you'll see that you'll be spending more uh, and more money And I'm just, again, I'm just putting, you know, dollar amounts in here quickly. Five million, maybe too much. And I'm just, I really should be spreading these out, but I'm just, again, just trying to go fast here. Now, of course, these target demographics, I don't believe, I think they're only for the, the reflective observation or role-playing part of the game they're not going to affect your demand, but the advertising investments, the money you put and the overall amount of money you spend will directly affect how many cars you will sell.
because that's something that's going to be compared against the other players. And I come back to uh, my production department. And here, for I don't need to buy any new plants for my economy class. I do need a new plant because I, I'm forecasting, oh, actually, no, I'm forecasting 3 million. And I have a capacity of, I'm sorry, 3 million, 3,000. I have a capacity of 4,000. That seems odd. I may want to look at that again. Eighteen. All right. So I'm going to actually just save this. I'm going to go back to the sales department for a second and see. Um, I think I could do this. I'm going to put change this to 3,500. And then go back to my production department and make this 3,500 since I have the capacity. Okay. And these two, I don't need to buy any new capacity. All right. So I'm going to buy some additional levels of investments. Now, what's interesting is if I go back to the sales department, you'll see here this is this. Operational cost reduction is now filled out. I'm saving $300 per vehicle. And here for the truck class, I'm saving $1,200 per vehicle. So you have your 6000 6, in labor, 12000 in material. My, so right there, it would be $18,375, these two together. But since I invested last round, I have a $1,200 savings. I'm only paying $1,700. And uh, seventeen thousand one hundred seventy-five dollars. So this helps to maintain or increase my profit margins per round. So that's why it's important to invest in those operational investments on the production page, uh, so I can keep up with my car being my profit margins. Because every round, the customers' expectations go up. In the sales department, every round, these customers' expectation ranges. Remember the last time it was at 30, now it's 31. Horsepower here was 100, now it's 120. Each round, these increase. And the prices increases too. But the price does never increases enough to make up the extra customer expectations. So if I don't keep reinvesting in the cost reductions, I'll never be able to maintain or improve my profit margins. And that, if you think about it, that sort of happens in the real world. If you look at cars from the 1980s, they didn't have GPS systems. In it. They didn't have auto lock brakes. They didn't have ABS. You know, um, they didn't have um, MP3 players or you know half you know uh, DVD players inside the cars. They didn't have half the features and engine efficiencies and things that they have today. And inflation adjusted, the cars aren't that much more expensive than the 80s. Car companies have just been doing a really good job at reducing costs and increasing manufacturing per, uh, efficiency to to be able to sell cars that aren't that much more exp that, that much more money than the 80s, but with so much more uh, luxury features and safety features uh, and, and warrant better warranties than previously, because customers are always expecting more and car companies are delivering it, which means that it becomes increasingly expensive to make these cars. Uh, so if you don't make these operational investments, your your company will quickly fall far behind the other companies. Okay, so now they've done that. Let's see. I'm running a sixty-four million dollar surplus this round. So here's my deficit. Um, so so I would have actually had a seventy million dollar surplus, but I'm had to pay back some of the deficit from the previous round. But since I'm making a surplus this round, I can either go in and retire some funds or maybe I want to go back and say okay I want to spend some more I want to get some more levels of cost reduction since I have some extra surplus I can make some more investments here okay so let me submit that and then I could see now it's only 39,000 39 million dollar <throat> surplus so I'm gonna actually retire some funds I have such a nice surplus. Now I have a $20 million surplus. I'm going to leave that because I had a, a deficit last round. I don't want to risk that again. And <clears throat> you could see if actually, you know, speaking of the deficit, if I go to my production department, I see right here this inventory. I had 371 unsold 
um, trucks, 126 unsold luxury, and 23 unsold uh, economy class. Those unsold cars, they never produced the sales or profits for me. Uh, and that's what led to my deficit, my unexpected deficit. So that's why you got to be careful when you're forecasting. And that's what can lead to your perform performers looking like they're going to be uh, in, you know, surplus territory, winding up in deficit territory. And a lot of students get confused when that happens. So I figured I'd go over that here to kind of clear that up. Okay, so let me process this individual practice and see what, what the results are. And here are the results. Okay, good. Again, I'm making um, above my 500 points that I need each round to get to the 3,000. I'm 586. And you'll see here that I was able to increase my revenues. Uh, my profit margins went from 48 to 53. My operating, my net. Um, let's see. Uh, my forecasts were uh, better. I earned some points there. And I had. Now, this is interesting. Operational investments. Since I doubled my investments, or more than doubled my investments, I earned 100 points. So, and in the cash surplus, I had a surplus of 20 million. I had 100 points there. So, all this um, ended up giving me a nice boost here of 583 points, which my goal is to make 500 points around. Now, some students say, what did these observations and total points, is this, what is this based on? And I asked the same question to the company. I wrote them an email and said, what is the, what is the uh, logic behind this setup? And they basically said they looked at analysts, stock analysts who are analyzing companies and trying to giving, giving ratings on buy, sell, or hold for companies, uh, how, you know, how banks would look at a company before they lend the money. And these were the things that companies looked at. They looked at their financial ratios. Are their revenues increasing? Are their debts under control? Are their profit margins stable or increasing? Are they are their total asset turnover? Are they getting more and more use of their assets? Are they are their return on equity for investors? And are their earnings per shares increasing? Do they have you know what's the ROA of their return on their assets? They do own the total market calculation, the book value for the company. So these are all things that financial analysts and credit analysts look at when trying to decide how good a company is. They also look at how well a company forecasts their sales from year to year. They look at what type of investments the company. They like companies that are investing in themselves for the future and remaining competitive. So that's why it's an important factor in you know, how well a company is doing. And they look at how well they manage their cash. And if companies have surpluses, that's very reassuring to investors and credit lenders. Deficits aren't. So these, this is a scorecard based on how outside people judge and look at the value of a company and the and you're always judged upon how well you improve over last year. Sort of like in your report card. If you, if you have um, a B average and you go down to a C plus average, that's not a good thing. And that wouldn't be, you know, so here, your year over year, just like your report card, you want to go from Bs to As, so your year over year improves, so your GPA goes up. And that's sort of the same thing the companies are being looked at. And then again, you know, after you analyze and kind of digest your points, you have your charts to look at and interpret. Now the next year is overlaid in here on your individual. And you could see that um, I actually messed up here. I could have sold 2,500 luxury vehicles and I could have sold the blue areas what I could have sold, 20, 2,300 trucks, but I only forecasted 2,000. So again, well, I just put those numbers in rather quickly. I didn't really pay attention to the user guide about um, how many cars I should average expectancy to be sold so it's another clue that you gotta read that student user guide over and get a good idea especially the forecasting area um, now and I, I lost some economy class cars I could have really sold a lot more than I did and those sales are going to go on to my competitors so that's why these charts are a good thing to get a good graphical overview of how you did against your competitors the industry of how your competitors put their cars together and you can see your total points get added every round and that's how we get to you know after round six we get our final score and then the process starts over again now we're in year three and we got to redesign the cars again and you say well this why do we redesign these cars every year professor nugent sounds like a waste of time this is not something would ever happen in the real world well actually in the real world car companies they do release uh, maybe not as quick as this but every year cars are redesigned and there there's you know improvements are made some minor some major and 
you know, every year a new model is produced. So you look at every, any car company, every year there's a Civic 2008, Civic 2009, Civic 2010, Civic 2011, Honda Civic 2012. Every year a new car comes out, certain modifications are made, features are added, taken away, prices are changed, and that's all in um, a reflection as to what the auto industry and what their customers want. So this is very true that every year car companies have to look at this. Every year car companies have to develop and redefine the marketing strategy and advertising strategies. They have to plan out their their production, how much they're going to sell, and what type of new technology to invest in, and they have to manage their expectations of their finances, how much money. So these are all the key decisions for a company's strategy. You know, if a company's going to make a strategy, it's involving all these areas. A, a strategy can't just be something that a company makes um, by itself. Just in, just the finance department can't do the strategy for the entire company. A company has to work together in every department to really de define their strategy put it together and execute it and then revisit what happened in the previous year and improve upon it. And that's what I'm trying to focus in on this, this simulation is to develop your ideas and your applications and your, and your implementation of strategy, help tie together some major courses that you've taken in, in the um, Stony Brook MBA, for example. You know, when you look at the finance department, this is a lot of your accounting course in here. Uh, the sales department is a lot of your marketing and advertising course. The um, production department is your operations class. Your fi you know, also in the finance department, of course, is your finance class. This is your capital structure. You can, you can create a way to average cost of capital for yourself. You can look at the investment you're making versus your return. So this is encompassing um, just as the 512 class is the capstone class of, of the MBA. It's also, you know, needs to tie together and bring together a lot of the elements that you learned in previous classes and make them make sense in a, in, in a whole entirety of how to run a company. And I find that the simulation along with the other materials does a great job of doing that. Okay, so that is my overview um, of the simulation to help you get started and explain what needs to be done and what I'm expecting. And just to go over it again, I am expecting that... Um, that you complete two rounds of the individual individual practice. I just did that in this uh, in this recorded lecture. I just did two, two rounds. You saw that didn't take me, you know, it's 50 minutes and I did two rounds, so it's not the most extensive assignment. And I'm talking you through the whole process. And remember, for the individual practice, you don't have to do the reflective observations. Now, by the end of this week, I do want you to complete the first round of the classroom competition. And in there, I will expect you to, to develop a mission statement for your company. Maybe they give you an industry background here. And I'm going to want you to complete all the reflective observations when you do the individual, I'm sorry, when you do the team competition and have this done. If you look in Blackboard, you'll have the due dates for each round. And make sure that you, you complete and submit each department and when you're done with the finance department you uh, very important that you click on submit financial data and complete the round so on my side I'll see that you have the round completed and I can process <coughs> any student that doesn't complete the round will lose a lot of points it won't prevent you from moving forward in the simulation it's just going to copy over the previous year's data but it will I make it very difficult to do well and earn the full points for this this assignment. Okay, well, that's it for for this video lecture. If you have any questions about the simulation, please see me on Wednesday for my office hours uh, through uh, SB Connect or send me an email. Uh, and I wish you the best of luck. I think this is a really great assignment. And after every round, I will record a follow-up lecture to, to discuss and analyze how the students have been doing and their results. Um, and we'll see how we you know. I'm pretty confident everybody will get the maximum points out of this. The the things that you can do to make sure that you get the 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 high amount of overall points for this game, so you can get the best score possible, is to utilize the practice game as much as possible and to read over that student user's guide. Both of those will be highly effective. Okay. Uh, thank you for your time, and I will talk to you again soon.